There you go. Okay. So I guess it's time to start uh, in this um, local afternoon session. Welcome uh, or welcome back, everyone. And we'll start with an um, excellent talk uh, by Philip uh, Windischofer. I hope I pronounce it correctly, uh, from Atlas and Oxford University. And he'll tell us about um, Higgs and uh, die boson measurement. Philip, the floor is yours. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe from my side also. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about EFT interpretations of recent Higgs measurements and a bit of die boson measurements at Atlas. Now, given that that's still a bit vague, uh, I should be more explicit. What my main goal is for this talk is to give you a summary of the activities that we have ongoing in Atlas in using Higgs boson measurements to constrain the standard model EFT. Now that zooms in to one aspect of Lalin's overview talk from yesterday afternoon. More in between the lines, I'm trying to answer questions such as how we actually ensure that the measurements that we use uh, as a starting point are actually robust enough and can reliably probe those mass defects. I'll explain how we then extract constraints on this MEF, and then I'll show you some results. All of this I will do from the point of view, oops, from, from the point of view of two hour recent results, which taken together nicely show the breadth of the activities that we have uh, ongoing in Atlas, which on the one hand is a recent combination of the Higgs to gamma gamma, Higgs to four lepton, and BHBB channels. And on the other hand, uh, is a recent combination uh, between the Higgs to WW measurement and the measurement of on shell W pair production. But before we go into the specifics, let me firstly paint the big picture of how we arrive at an Atlas Higgs EFT result. At the very beginning, on the left hand side, of course, we start with some reconstructed distributions, typically invariant masses or some multivariate discriminants. Uh, we then use the information contained in those distributions to unfold or to extract uh, certain cross-sections, can be fiducial cross-sections in the SDXS scheme, which we'll remind you of in just a second, uh, or indeed explicitly unfolded differential cross-sections. These then form the input uh, that we use to actually extract uh, constraints on, on SMEFT operators. Now, in this scheme, of course, there are certain assumptions that enter, and these enter predominantly where I put these two pink arrows. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the extraction of these cross section, of course, involves some sort of unfolding of detector effects, and the dynamics of that unfolding can be modified in this method. And I'll have more to say about that in a second. On the other hand, it's, of course, the parameterization of this MEF modifications to those cross sections directly that is based on assumptions in their own right. And I'll also make those more explicit, more explicit as we go along. But before we get there, uh, let me briefly just say a few words about the STXS, given that it forms a very central ingredient to the results I'm about to show. Now, STXS, or simplified template cross sections, are nothing but Higgs production mode cross sections in certain well defined fiducial volumes. The STXS seem to strike a compromise between making measurements of quantities to which we have very good experimental sensitivity on the one hand and measuring things that are very model independent on the other hand. So conceptually, SDXS is somewhere in between an inclusive signal strength and a differential cross-section on the other hand. Uh, a very important design criterion that goes into the design of those bins uh, also was to isolate regions in which possible BSM effects are enhanced. Uh, for example, here in the graph below, uh, for the VH production mode, the SDXS are binned in terms of the PT of the vector boson, which is a nice surrogate for the overall scale at which the process is occurring, and therefore set if you want the scale uh, of possible new physics effects. Now, the important thing uh, for the next two or three slides or so will be uh, to explain how to think of the SDXS in the context of the SMEF. Now, when I, when I say SMEF, then we really do the same thing as always. We take the standard model Lagrangian and we extend it uh, by some higher dimensional operators. For us in Higgs physics, uh, really the leading contribution comes from mass dimension six. And this is, only, this is also the, all, the only class of operators that we take into account. If then you take this SMEF Lagrangian and you use it to compute cross sections, well, then any cross section will receive three different kinds of contributions. On the one hand, you will, of course, have the standard model part. Then you will have some interference between the standard model and uh, matrix elements that have a single dimension six insertion. And this will scale linearly with the couplings of those, with the Wilson coefficients of those dimension six operators. And then you have some term that scales like the square of the Wilson coefficients. 
overall. That means any cross section in this method will be a polynomial in the Wilson coefficients, and that polynomial will simply act as a multiplicative modification of the original standard model cross section. Now, that's not only true for uh, cross sections, but it's also true for decay rates uh, in particular. And that allows us to parameterize the thing that we are actually experimentally looking at, which is the cross section times the branching ratio of the Higgs to go into a certain final state, uh, simply as a rational function of those polynomials. Uh, it's just uh, put together by the modification to the production cross section itself, as well as the modification to the partial and total decay width. Each of those will be given uh, by their own polynomials. Now, in principle, you could look at this rational function and you could expand it further in power and inverse powers of the suppression scale lambda. Uh, and at that point, you fall back to an overall polynomial dependence if that's what you wanted to do. Now, this parameterization is fully specified as soon as I write down what these numerical constants are, the alphas, betas, the a's, and the b's. Uh, and we extract those coefficients uh, from explicit calculations of the processes we're interested in. For example, for loop-induced processes, such as loop glue Z Higgs or the Higgs decaying into gluons, uh, we use MathGraph uh, plus method at NLO to do that. While for processes which already exist at tree level, we resort to MathGraph plus MathSim. In case these parameterizations exist analytically, we of course make use of those results, uh, such as for the, the partial Higgs to gamma gamma decay width. And then all of this, uh, we use the Warshaw basis for we use as input parameters the W and the Z mass, as well as the Fermi constant. Uh, we apply uh, the U3 symmetry, flavor symmetry to the participating quark and lepton fields, and we set the suppression scale lambda uh, to be equal to 1 TeV by convention. And then in the end, we get this polynomial, and we use that to rescale the nominal standard model prediction uh, that is used by the various analyses. And I should also say that. The standard model prediction nominally or typically is of a different order uh, in QCD than these calculations uh, that we do here in the context of this method. Now, with the preliminaries out of the way, let me show you some results. Uh, let me show you the first one that I promised to talk about, uh, which is this recent Higgs combination. Now, as I said, this is a simultaneous measurement at the end of the day of STXS spins for the Higgs to gamma gamma, Higgs to four leptons, and VHBB channels. Uh, you can see in the visualization here on the right what all of those spins look like. Uh, at the very top of the plot, you have 26 spins coming from Higgs to gamma gamma across the various production modes. Uh, then uh, you have Higgs to four leptons, which contributes 12 spins across the same production mode, but with slightly reduced granularity. And at the bottom of the plot, uh, you have five spins from the VHBB measurement, uh, which gives very, very good control over the VH channel in five different bins. Now, in the next two slides or so, I would like to point out certain features that you can find uh, the SMEFT modifications to those SDXS spins exhibit. Now, I'm going to show plots like this one, where on the horizontal axis, uh, you now have the SDXS spins that you just saw on the previous slide. And on the vertical axis, you have the relative modifications uh, to the cross section times the branching ratio when you turn on various operator combinations. Uh, and if you look at the central part of the plot, which shows modifications uh, to the VH cross-section, uh, you can see that generically, the impact of those various operators tends to increase with the PT uh, of the vector boson, which exactly ties back to what I said before about this uh, quantity setting the scale uh, of this process. I focus here on these two operators. Uh, on the one hand, the HQ3 operator on the left and the HD operator here on the right both of which modify WH and ZH production cross-sections in similar ways. They generate these effective four-point interactions between the Higgs, the vector boson, uh, and the incoming quarks. If you go to other operators, uh, then the impacts can look a bit different. Uh, here you see HL3 in blue and LL prime uh, in red. Uh, and you can see that these operators tend to lead to an impact or to a modification, which is more or less constant uh, across the PT uh, or across STXS spins and also contact, contact um, a constant across different production modes. And the mechanism by which this effect comes into play uh, is the following one. Uh, at low energies, of course, this MEF should reproduce what we know uh, about the lifetime of the muon. And in particular, it should reproduce the Fermi constant, which is indeed one of the inputs uh, that we use to, to fix all of our parameters. Now, it turns out that these two operators also produce four fermion interactions that participate uh, in the process here on the left. Uh, and as such, they're able to change the relation between the Fermi constant and the electroweak coupling uh, that then as an input parameter, if you want, to those, to those calculations here at the top, manage to change the cross sections. 
Now, here you have a huge plot with all of the operators uh, that were studied uh, in the context of the sixth combination. There are four panels that group the operators in various different, if you want, physics-inspired ways. Uh, the central two groups we have already looked at, uh, modifications to BH and changes to electric recoupling. Uh, there's operators at the very top, uh, which tend to modify uh, interactions between the Higgs and N-gauge bosons. Uh, and there's a couple of operators also at the very bottom uh, that modify also these interactions uh, and in addition lead to four fermion interactions. Now, I should point out one feature in this plot, which is not immediately visible here, uh, which is to say that we parameterize cross-section times branching ratio everywhere. But what we actually want to parameterize, of course, is the event yield that's visible to all of those analyses because that's what we start from. Uh, and these two things coincide if and only if changes to the acceptance uh, are not important. Now, what I want to convince you of now is that changes to the acceptance of the analysis can be important in certain cases uh, and should be considered. And the context in which I make this claim is the Higgs to four leptons analysis, where to increase somehow uh, their sensitivity, uh, what is done here is to apply and cut on the invariant mass of the off-shell Z boson, okay, M34. Uh, the distribution of M34 in the standard model is shown here on the top, uh, on the bottom right in black. Uh, and you can nicely see that most of the signal indeed comes to lie within the analysis acceptance. Now, on the other hand, the distribution of that quantity can change quite considerably if you turn on certain smapped operators, in particular the HW operator here, which skews the distribution towards the left, and therefore a larger portion of the signal falls outside the analysis acceptance, and the overall signal uh, acceptance will drop uh, quite significantly. Uh, more quantitatively, you can see that on the left plot here, uh, which really shows just the, the signal acceptance as a function of the Wilson coefficient of this HW operator. And you can nicely see as, as you turn on this operator, you, you, you decrease quite a lot your, your acceptance. On the right here, uh, you see the parameterization of either the cross-section times branching ratio in blue, which of course doesn't know about these acceptance effects. Uh, and you would expect to see a strong increase, if you want, uh, of that quantity if you turn on HW. But as soon as you factor in acceptance modifications, uh, this trend turns around completely, and now you have a mild decrease actually in the visible event yield uh, due to the drop in the acceptance. So the bottom line here is, of course, the dynamics of the analysis can change in this method, uh, and you should uh, convince yourself uh, that you understand what's going on. Now, going back to this big overview plot, uh, I want to point out one more thing, which is sort of even clear visually, is that even though we have a lot of SDXS pins to build on here, uh, the impact generated on these bins by various operators is still reasonably similar. In other words, there will be groups of operators that cannot be distinguished based on only those SDXS bins that we have. And so instead of pretending that we're able to discriminate between those different operators, we should rather acknowledge the fact that we can't, uh, and you should think of operator groups. In other words, so we, we group together operators that have similar effects on the data that we have at the moment. Uh, we then drop combinations of those operators which we cannot really constrain at all or not constrain very well based on the data set that we have. And we only keep those operator combinations which we have good control over. In other words, we do some sort of principal component analysis if you want. Uh, and this Higgs combination here is powerful enough to constrain 10 uh, of those operator combinations simultaneously. Now, the, the big table here at the bottom just shows that the, the composition of those 10 different operator combinations along the rows in terms of the original Warshaw basis operators. Uh, and the numerical coefficients here are just really the coefficients with which a certain Warshaw basis operator contributes to a certain operator combination. And then what I tried to highlight here are somehow the sort of this, these groups, uh, these sub matrices that are made by grouping together operators with similar structures and therefore similar impacts on our data. Now, and then you can just transition from the original Warshaw basis on the left uh, to think entirely in terms of your principal components on the right, and then you extract certain limits. Now, the plot here shows uh, a subset of those limits. These are the 10 operator combinations that we can constrain, and these are one dimensional limits that are extracted from a simultaneous fit uh, of those 10 uh, directions. That means each line has the other ones profiled out. Now, the blue limits here come uh, for, or for the case when I only take into account linear parameterization. That means we only use the interference term. Everything is manifestly linear in the Wilson coefficients. Uh, and the orange ones take into account the explicit quadratic term as well. If you focus on the top panel here, uh, which shows the three combinations to which we're most sensitive, 
uh, then the constraints can be quite significant uh, and they translate into a new physics scale of the order of three TeV uh, that we can probe here from, from Higgs data alone. Now here is uh, a different view onto the same results. These are just the likelihood scans that gave rise to uh, the limits on the previous slide. Uh, on the very left-hand side plot, uh, you can see the likelihood scan for the top operator combination, the one that we have the most sensitivity to. Uh, and you can see that the blue and the orange are the two different parameterization schemes. They give rise to very compatible limits overall. But that, that's not generically the case, as you can see in the other two, uh, in the other two plots, which show subleading uh, operator combinations where the limits can indeed be quite significantly different. And that, of course, is indicative that we have certain sensitivity to effects of lambda to the fourth, limit ones that, that sort of differ between the blue and the orange, uh, and that, of course, are, the, are of the same order as interference terms of dimension eight, uh, and as such are uh, some notion of theory uncertainty, if you want. OK, now let's leave that result behind us, and let's have a brief look at the second one that I promised uh, to speak about. This is uh, a combined measurement of uh, the Higgs to WW decay on the one hand, where the Ws decay into a pair of opposite flavor leptons with their associated neutrinos, and the measurement of on-shell W pair production uh, with the same final state on the other hand. This exercise is based on two existing analyses, uh, which overall make use of 36 inverse femtobarn uh, of the RAN2 data set. And in many ways, this combination here is prototypical of some of the challenges that we will encounter on our way towards a more global atlas-wide EFT fit. On the one hand, of course, it's important that the analysis did a combined target orthogonal portions of the signal, uh, and that's ensured here by simply trading off the on-shell versus off-shell nature of the Ws in both of those cases uh, by a cut on the invariant mass of the visible leptons. Uh, on the other hand, the control regions that were originally used in those separate analyses were not orthogonal to start with, uh, and so this had to be resolved, this overlap had to be resolved before the combination could take place. Of course, W pair production is also a background to, to the Higgs to WW decay. Uh, and so you have to make sure that you parameterize MEFT effects on both of those components coherently everywhere uh, that you look at them. Acceptance modifications also exist, but they're less important than, than the what I showed before. At the end of the day, uh, what we use as an input uh, for the EFT interpretation is uh, a finely binned differential cross-section measurement of the Higgs to, uh, of the, of the on-shell W pair production uh, cross-section uh, here at the top of this plot. Uh, this is a differential cross-section with respect to the PT of the leading lepton. Uh, and from Higgs to WW, we take the inclusive signal strengths for the gluon fusion and VBF production modes. Again, here is uh, a quick visualization of what the impact of certain operators on all of those observables looks like. Uh, and sort of they're split here in three different groups. Again, uh, the top group uh, predominantly contains uh, operators producing for fermion interactions, which then tend to modify uh, the W pair production cross section. At the very bottom, uh, you have operators that talk to the Higgs, and as such, they show up on the right hand side of this plot, which is about the Higgs to WW analysis. And then in the center part of this plot, uh, you have uh, a number of operators that strongly affect both simultaneously. And of course, it's limited on those operators that you would expect to profit most from this combination. If then you have a look at the limits, uh, then this is uh, the picture that you get. The limits that I show here on the right are really now one dimensional limits on each of the original Warshaw basis Wilson coefficients individually. That is to say, in each row here, only a single coefficient is allowed to, uh, to be turned on and all the other ones are switched off. Uh, and in red, you have the limits that come out of the, the W pair production measurement. In yellow, you have the limits that come out of the Higgs WW analysis and in blue, you finally have the limits from the combination. Uh, and it, it's, you can clearly see that, for example, this HL3 operator here, really the limits on its Wilson coefficients really, really profit from this combination of these two channels, given that this operator is really one of those in the middle group uh, of the previous plot uh, that can affect both physical processes uh, in a very strong, in a very coherent way. And that's, of course, the exact, um, the exact case uh, where doing this math makes a lot of sense. And it's very nice to see that we can slowly start to reach uh, this regime where what we do actually makes, makes a lot of sense. I should also say, also here, we extracted principal components uh, and according to, to, some, to the same procedure that I uh, mentioned previously, and I've put all the details about that in the backup uh, in case you want to uh, have a look at them or chat about them afterwards. 
Now, with that, uh, let me just briefly summarize. I hope I could convince you a bit that what we do in Atlas on EFT interpretations in the Higgs group uh, is certainly uh, a very rapidly advancing field and a very dynamic adventure. Uh, our general strategy for now is to start from the measurements that we've made, either of SDXS uh, cross-sections or of explicitly unfolded differential cross-sections, and then to recast those measurements through the lens uh, of this method. Now, when we do that, it's important that we don't forget that the analyses or the measurements that originally gave rise to those results are in simply black boxes, but they have certain substructures, and these substructures can be modified in this method in a non-trivial way, as we saw uh, with the changes to the acceptance. The trend, uh, looking toward the future, the trend clearly goes towards larger scale combinations and eventually, of course, an atlas-wide global EFT fit with the full data set that we have. Uh, but until we get there, uh, stay tuned for more results and thanks for listening. Thank you, Philip. Are there questions uh, from the room? Questions? Uh... Maybe I can ask a quick question. Uh, could you go back to maybe, uh, I think, page 24? Uh, so it looks like on the plot uh, on the right-hand side, there's uh, some deviation uh, with the uh, observed, uh, between the observed uh, value and the standard model prediction. But then the, uh, the fit with the quadratic piece seems to be uh, more consistent with the standard model. So uh, is there a reason like maybe there's some cancellation between the two terms or something? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right. Okay, and, thanks. But yeah, that's, <laughs> and of course, when I say these limits differ, then it's either, and you can maybe even better see that here, uh, it's either that the extent of the limits differs or if you want their central value shifts. And both somehow, you know, go into this notion of a theory uncertainty, which isn't a very well-defined concept, so to speak. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Uh, Nobody else okay. in the room. We have a couple of hands online. Uh, I think Alejo was first. Yes, uh, thanks, Claudia, and thanks, Philip, for the nice talk. Uh, I had a question regarding your analysis of Higgs to four leptons, where when you showed this distribution on the invariant mass of the lepsons coming from the shell, yes, exactly that one. Uh, how is the distribution of the backgrounds and why do you use this acceptance cut instead of binning, for example, in a bin where basically you have the standard model and a bin for the smaller mass where you have the peak of the DSM distributions? Yeah, so the, the, the choices, if you want, that were made here, namely the fact that we have this cut and so on, uh, these were choices that were made based on the fact that we target the standard model Higgs. Okay, this is somehow, if you want, the consequence of our two-stage approach that we have. First of all, produce very robust measurements and very, you know, precise measurements to target a standard model, and then only in a second step afterwards follow up on possible, you know, Smith interpretations and so on. Uh, so it's clear that this analysis would look different if we had target from the outset. Uh, if we had had the idea in our minds from the outset of actually turning that into uh, a SMEF um, analysis that you know has certain features that we wouldn't need, that we wouldn't want it to have if we only looked at the standard model case. Okay, so, it's, so yeah. yeah, it would be interesting to redo the analysis and see what you can yes. gain with the uh, beam. Absolutely. So that's yeah, absolutely. So, so somehow, I imagine this will also change somewhat. You know, going into the future that we will. To, certain, to a certain degree, move away from this very strict, you know, two-stage paradigm where we don't touch the analysis anymore as soon as we have reached the second step. So I imagine there will be, you know, situations where rechanging or retuning a bit the analysis can have significant gains uh, as soon as you start to look at the interpretation. I expect people, I expect people to exploit that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Did, Thanks. Did you, did you expect that the um, STXS would change to? Um, avoid those kind of effects in the future to have find a binning, for instance? Yeah, the, what I know is that um, so, so the, the, these effects here, they come from the Higgs decay, right? And that's if you want some other, the problem with the SDXS, they, they don't define a fiducial volume for the Higgs decay, right? They define fiducial volumes for the Higgs production. Uh, you know, so, so maybe it's worthwhile having something similar to SDXS, but now also looking at the Higgs decay, which comes with, you know, defining something like that comes with its own problems. Uh, 
multiple different things could happen. That's one possible avenue. Another possible avenue uh, would be to, to a certain degree move away from the SDXS. So I combined like 2D fits with like SDXS pins on one side and certain other distributions, maybe angular ones on the other side. You know, at that point you can start to think about CP order operators and so on. And so there are certain you know combinations that, that we are exploring at the moment. Thanks. Lena was next um, with a question. Um, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I have a um, kind of a um, practical question. Uh, are the um, the values of like background and signals uh, from the uh, SDXS um, from Atlas available for public? Like uh, if one needs to construct likelihoods from them to do fits on other operators, for example. Uh, so I think it depends. The answer depends a bit on on the specific analysis that you're interested in. I don't think the six combination centrally made those values available, but I know for sure that certain, that at least one of the analysis that went into that has a very extensive HEP data entry where you can actually look up uh, all of these values, mm -hmm. which is the Higgs I, What I saw in the paper were mainly just the new, the, the, the parameter of interest, but sometimes it's useful to right. reconstruct back the whole likelihood. Yeah, yeah I see. Yeah. so. Yeah, we acknowledge the fact that you know there is this push towards you know, even publishing the full likelihood in, in certain ways, right? And then you know to make that available, uh, which is a bit difficult to do in, in a transparent way with these huge likelihood models that go into those combination fits, right? Mm -hmm. They have so many parameters that are hard to document because they you know they are very if you want entwined with all the details of the analysis in very you know complicated ways. Uh, mm -hmm. So going for a full likelihood publication is certainly something that makes a lot of sense today for like say searches or, or, or things like that, where yeah. the models tend to be simpler. Uh, but mm -hmm. for measurements, I don't think we have yet uh, found a very good trade-off between sort of exposing the full details and just exposing the results, which then maybe is not enough for, for, for people to do what they want. Yeah, I mean, if you want to do like a bin likelihood, it'll be more sensitive for that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, are there any last urgent questions? I don't see any, it's actually time to move on. Next up is uh, Lina again. 